JCBA office. I've been there now probably close to four years uh, working with him. Uh, before that and even after that for eight years I was pastor at Calvary Baptist Church on Market Street. Uh, helped work a little bit with Arlington to uh, have them come over there and Ricardo to go to Arlington and work a little bit of a, a, a three church kind of swap and growth and transition and change. I'm originally from the area. I was uh, born in Oakland, California. My dad was in the Navy at the time, so I was born in the Naval Hospital in Oakland while he was in the Navy. But we were originally from the Mobile area. My mom and dad were both born in a house in Ballabatry, Alabama. I come from a long line of shrimpers and oysters and people who lived and made their living off the Gulf Coast. I was here until I was 11. Uh, I went to W.C. Griggs Elementary School on Three Notch Croner. Uh, I was there in 63 when Kennedy was assassinated. I was a little school crossing guard. I still remember that to this day. We left when Brooklyn Air Force Base was closed down. My dad took another uh, position at Kelly Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. So I spent my uh, junior high school and high school years in San Antonio. In 1972, I went to college in Florida, uh, and just previous to that, I think it was like in Easter of 72, I dedicated my life to Christ and decided to follow him in ministry. But it started way before that because I actually made a decision for Christ as a child, and I did it through a boys club at uh, Travis Road Baptist Church off Three Notch Croner Road in the RAs, Royal Ambassadors for Christ. And it was during that time that uh, the leadership in that ministry uh, brought me to a place where I understood and received Christ as my Savior and started to walk with Christ. But it wasn't until I was a, in my last year of high school, in 1972, I went to an Easter camp. I went there because I went on a football scholarship to play football. I didn't realize at the time it was a Bible camp. And so there was a little bit of bait and switch going on. Uh, I was playing in, in high school, and they asked me to come to this camp, and I'd have opportunity to play, and no one actually told me it was a Bible camp, but it wasn't all bad because there was a lot of girls there at the time. <laughs> and so for a high school student, you know, it was a mixed bag, but it was during that camp in Palacios, Texas, that I dedicated myself to actually ministry. So in 73 of December... I moved to Florida and went to Bible college and got my BA there. And then in 76, I met this Canadian girl from Montreal. Her brother was in the same Bible college that I was, and we became friends and worked in the same youth ministry in a place called Carroll City, Miami. And during that youth ministry, we grew to know each other fairly well. And his sister would always come down at the end of May, pack up her little Volkswagen with all his stuff and drive back to Montreal. It was during that stint that I met my wife of today, after 40 years, Laura. And so in 76, after I graduated college, I came home. My parents were living at the time in Pascagoula, Mississippi, and I couldn't get out of Pascagoula fast enough. I wasn't there a week before I jumped into my little Volkswagen loaded it up, and drove to Montreal. When I got to Montreal, it was probably in June, uh, uh, Laura and I began to stoke the relationship. It was really a phone relationship while I was in college for about four months. In fact, I could pay for my phone bill, I just couldn't pay for my school bill. <laughs> During those last four months before I left. And so uh, uh, following that, I ended up staying in Canada for 32 years. I became a landed immigrant. I pastored in Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver during those 32 years. In the midst of that, in the midst of that, the Bible college education I got taught me to love God's Word. It gave me a love for the Bible. 
My master's degree, when I was in Toronto, I went to Tyndale Seminary. At the time, it was called Ontario Theological Seminary in Toronto, but it later changed its name to Tyndale Seminary. So I went there and got my MDiv, and during that time, I began to love the church. I learned a lot of things I didn't know before. It broadened my perspective, and I went to school while I was pastoring. And then after I graduated from there, I got caught up in what they called the church growth movement. It originally kicked off with Perspectives on Mission out of Fuller, uh, Fuller Seminary in California. And the Perspectives on Mission was basically a, a large bound book about missions all over the globe. And they started to take some of those principles and ask themselves, how do you grow a church? And so I got caught up into that. And so for the next 20 years, basically, I started reading everything on church growth, went to every seminar, visited Willow Creek in Barrington, Illinois, uh, where Bill Hybels was, visited Rick Warren in Saddleback in California, read everything I could voraciously, and I did my doctor of ministry on church growth at the time at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Deerfield, Illinois, which at the time had one of the first D-Men programs and it was a very successful program and one of the best in the nation. So I went through that and did my D-men in church growth. And so for the next 20 years, I basically went in, transitioned churches. We did lots of changes. We grew churches. I spent over $10 million on church buildings during that time. And I learned a lot of stuff. But it wasn't until 2005 that my life changed in a new way in ministry. And that was Katrina. I was in Vancouver at the time that Katrina hit, and I'd just been here in August. I was marrying my son uh, over at uh, Promised Land off irvington Battery Highway, and uh, I left. Two weeks later, Katrina hit. After that, I raised $30,000 and brought 30 men here, and in November, we built two homes, one in Pascagoula on 4th, 14th Street and one on Rabbi Road off of Shell Belt Road and Bala Battery. And at that time, I hooked up with an organization called the Volunteers of America. And during that time, over the next three years, from 2005 to 2008, I came every year, raised money every year, and brought teams every year to do Katrina work. And that's how I met Helen Rabby. And when she was working in the office at the JCBA, her and Shirley. And uh, so we began to stoke up a relationship as well during that time. And uh, then, of course, Philip came on the scene some, what, eight years ago or something, 2009. I had only been here one year, and because of my relationship with the JCBA and uh, Ernie Sadler at the time, who tried to get me to go to Calvary while I was here, one thing led to another, and now I have a relationship with the VOA and the JCBA doing the same thing, which is basically mission work, trying to touch the lives of individuals. I'm telling you all of this because I think it's more important for you to know my heart than for me to just give you a Bible passage tonight. I'll do that. I'll give you three passages. But I want you to know a little bit of who I am because I'm what you call a person who's living their dream. When I left Canada, I had an investment man there, a friend of mine. His name was Doug and his wife, Shirley. When I decided to leave Canada, Doug flew to, uh, to uh, Vancouver, and he said, Derek, Shirley and I would like to make your dream possible down south. We will fund your work, and you can do it as long as you wish to do it. And so over the past nine, eight, eight, it'll be nine years, September the 5th, the past nine years, I have raised and spent about three quarters of a million dollars helping people on the Gulf Coast here. We build wheelchair ramps, we help seniors, we help veterans, we help the disabled, we help the uninsured, we help those engaged in disasters. And uh, basically I am doing something that I feel heartfelt and passionate about, but Katrina is what really lit a fire under me. I'll be honest with you. I'd been pastoring for like 30 years, and nothing made me more passionate than the tangible aspect 
of changing a person's life who had been through a disaster. You know, nothing had been more tangible than that. I brought a few brochures tonight. What we do is I publish this every month. And uh, the products are a culmination of two things. Many of the volunteers of the Jackson County Baptist Association churches and the money that I have raised with the Volunteers of America. And what we call this, when two organizations get together to work together, we call it synergy. We can do together as a pair more than we could do as individuals. And so over this past year, we have had 55 projects in our area in which you live. There have been 1,067 volunteers work this year, and there have been over 6,707 volunteer hours donated to this cause. Now, you know, those numbers to me are staggering because when I first came, it was a lot harder than that. But between the JCBA and the VOA, I hardly get a chance to breathe. And I love every minute of it. You know, I just love doing what I'm doing. Now, I woke up some years back thinking, you know, remember all the work, Derek, you did to study church growth and uh, all the principles engaged in it and to develop a philosophy of ministry and a methodology of growing a church? Um, but there was always seemed something missing. Everything I did in the church was for the church. It was for the people of the church. Rarely did we budget anything that actually touched the community in a tangible way. And I'll tell you what, in the past nine years that I've been engaged in what I'm doing, I'm happier with the $750,000 I've spent to help people than I ever was on the $10 million I spent on building churches. It's just a huge disconnect, you know, in life. You can do so much more to tangibly help people in the name of Jesus Christ and make him known by what you actually do. So I started to evaluate a little bit of the things that I had studied over the years and my thesis that I wrote in my doctor of ministry program and all the church growth principles that I'd been sold out to and believe very much a lot of the stuff is just basically sociological in relationship to church growth. But there was something missing for me. Normally, two passages of Scripture are developed to determine a philosophy of ministry of church growth. One is called the Great Commission, right? And that's Matthew 28. And it reads, Jesus came and told his disciples. So this is Jesus speaking. He says, I have been given complete authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's one of the passages of which almost all church growth books will derive three principles on church growth. The other passage is called the Great Commandment. And that passage is found in Matthew 22, where Jesus again says... You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the other commandments and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. I'll give you a classic example. Saddleback Church, where Rick Warren is, has five principles, and they're based on these two passages. There, it's the idea of worship, fellowship, discipleship, ministry, and mission. Three are taken from the Matthew 28 passage, two are taken from the Matthew 22 passage. But I started to think about that for a while, and I said, but you know what? Jesus didn't have the purpose-driven church to read. What did he read? What motivated him to do the ministry that he was engaged in? And I found it. I found it in, in uh, the Gospel of Luke. And in Luke chapter 4, we read this. Now, this is after the temptation and after Jesus has been approved by, for ministry and after the, the Holy Spirit rests upon him. And then Jesus starts his 
his ministry. And he says this in verse 18, because he unrolls the scroll and he says this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. So he's going to go out and start church growth. This is going to be his ministry start. What did he read? Isaiah 61. That was his church growth manual. Isaiah 61. And it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has appointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the downtrodden will be freed from their oppressors, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. That was Jesus' mission statement for growing the kingdom. And I said, you know what? Not one church growth book I ever read included that passage. And who better than Jesus would be the one we'd want to follow and the one we'd want to emulate, the one we'd want to imitate, the one that we wanted to follow his paradigm than this particular passage. The things that every church must include in its mission has to include Luke 4, 18. It has to. Because that's when Jesus touched people. That's how he reclaimed people. That's how he healed the brokenhearted. That's how, the, why did he choose a prophet? Because the prophets hated inequity. They hated injustice. They hated oppression. They hated what the fall did to mankind. All of Jesus' life, if you follow him, it was redeeming situations, redeeming people, redeeming circumstances, redeeming brokenness, unbinding people, loosing people, freeing people. That's what it was all about. And that's the one thing, the one component that so much of the church growth and renewal movement missed. They missed the example of what it meant to follow Jesus as Jesus followed Isaiah 61. That was his mission statement. That was his life verse. You know how some people choose a life verse? That's Jesus' life verse. That's his life verse. That's what he began to emulate. And I think the reason why I feel more passionate about what I'm doing now than even when I was growing churches, and I had a successful ministry in growing churches, but I really believe much of it was sociological that I was doing in building community. And little of it was actually tangibly helping the brokenhearted, the oppressed, the poor, the captive in life. And so for me, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm living my dream. I have somebody who loved me enough and believed in me enough, a couple who was willing to invest in me and have been doing it for like nine years now. And, and fortunately, because the Canadian dollar is not as good as the American dollar, just so you know, I don't know what happened to it because when I went, first went to Canada in 1976, the Canadian dollar was worth 10 cents more than the American dollar. It was worth 10 cents more. Now it's like 75 cents on the dollar. So when I, moved, when I moved here, I lost 25% of my assets just to move here. It wasn't a fun experience, you know. And so things have changed in life. But I am living the dream because I'm doing exactly what I wanted to do. My dad keeps asking me, Derek, when are you going to retire? Retire? I'm living the dream. <laughs> Who retires when you're living the dream? Nobody. You know, he says, but shouldn't you slow down? For what? You know, I, you know, if I slow down, I probably won't be able to move. Because I, I do that at nighttime. I sit in the lazy boy. Try to get me out. If I've been working all day, and, and I, I have a great group of guys who work with me regularly. Every week, we're doing a project. In fact, one of the projects in here that you'll see on this particular page is Rodney and Jennifer Williams' place. <clears throat> sometime, sometime back, they asked us if we would help them build an office so they could do more of their counseling ministry and their, from Club Meth to Club Christ ministry, 
over, since Thursday, let's see, two days, a week before that, we did the foundation, completed it. And then from Thursday to Tuesday at 2 o'clock, we finished the building for them. So it's all blacked in. Now, the inside's not done. They don't have drywall. They don't have electrical. They don't have plumbing or anything like that. No flooring. None of that stuff is done, but it's blacked in. And we did that basically in four days. And the people who did it, Jackson County Baptist Churches did it. And they've been doing that now for, what, almost four years. It's, it's kind of like the best kept secret, you know, in Jackson County. But they work like crazy. They accomplish so much. And so I brought, I didn't bring enough for everybody, but there's about 30 of these here. And you're welcome to take them before you leave uh, tonight if you wish and you desire. And uh, we also put a lot of this information into our, uh, our newsletter, uh, the JCBA newsletter. Uh, but I, for me, I'm doing exactly what I want to do. I'm doing exactly what I believe God wants me to do. It's different than what I did for, you know, 32 years. But I'll tell you what, folks. When you do something for someone and you change their life in a heartbeat, when they are broken and broke and can't fix their place or can't build a wheelchair ramp or can't repair their roof or they have fallen through their floors or their husband died. Today I met a lady over in uh, Orange Grove. Her name is Mrs. Pettis. I think she's a member of Franklin Creek Baptist Church. Uh, Jesse Pettis. Her husband was going to build a wheelchair ramp before he died, of course. He died before he built it. So we're going to build it and put it up for her. But when you do that for people, they realize that the church is a very hands-on kind of thing. You know what I mean? It's not just talking about helping people. You're actually helping people. You're doing it. And we do it with tons of people in the community. And I'm happy to be able to share my story with you. And hopefully the rationale behind it for me. As the one, one point of methodology and principles I missed in the midst of all the church work I did for 32 years was the Luke 4 passage. When Jesus came, he already had a paradigm. And all we really have to do is adopt that verse as our life verse. And you will redeem and reclaim a fallen world, one person at a time. Our Father, we thank you for...